Do you remember the Ice Bucket Challenge? It was a massive campaign that raised quite a lot of money for charities and especially charities uh, for ALS. That was a great thing, I thought. But how much of this money actually went for research? So for those of you that are not familiar with uh, what ALS is, ALS is a motor neuron disorder, which means uh, there is a degeneration of the cells in the brain that control voluntary muscle movement. The symptoms that are usually associated with it are a progressive loss of the limbs, which usually brings about uh, a lot of pain, such as neuropathic pain, as well as muscle pain, from being born often to a wheelchair or to a bed. Um, also, facial muscles uh, get a degeneration, so that could lead to difficulties on swallowing as well as talking. Um, the appetite decreases consistently, and mood disorders such as depression are often a, a symptom of the disease. This pathology, ALS, it's a devastating disorder. After diagnosis, patients have an average span life of three to five years, which determines that since we have no cure for this disease, that there is a clear and met clinical need that we need to address right now. So many patients around the world started to self-medicate with cannabis. They could notice that cannabis was a great aid for managing some of their symptoms. It could, for example, increase their appetite and uh, it could deal pretty well with muscle spasms as well as pain. And uh, it gave as well, they could feel a general sense of well-being that really helps the symptoms of depression. So, by the data, by collecting data of these patients that were self-medicating with cannabis, something quite out striking came out, which was that patients, those patients, compared to the ones that were taking prescription medication, they could outlive the others, so the cannabis taker, they could outlive the non-cannabis taker from 5 to 15 years. Moreover, the disease progression of the patients uh, medicating with cannabis was much less aggressive. So this obviously raised the awareness of quite a lot of scientists that wanted to find out a bit more about what was happening with cannabis that could make you know, the, the, the disease more manageable, but also going at a slower pace. Was there something in cannabis that could help darkly managing the symptoms and maybe even reversing the disease? We're gonna find that out. So before we start tackling into the scientific evidence that I want to bring to you today to talk about uh, why cannabis could be very beneficial to ALS patients, I would like to make a little note on uh, how to investigate a complex disorder such as ALS. For example, so far we don't have a complete, full, clear understanding of ALS. We don't know yet why exactly does ALS comes about. But we have, however, uh, quite a lot of hallmarks that we can recognize now that tell us that it is possible that um, are correlated related to ALS. One of these, for example, is called excitotoxicity. It's not just related with ALS. Excitotoxicity, for example, happens when the cell gets intoxicated with too much glutamate. Glutamate is a neurotransmitter, but when we have too much of, the, of this neurotransmitter, it can be uh, detrimental and quite toxic to our brain. Also, uh, from comparing and looking at uh, families and heredi hereditary, sorry, hereditary forms of ALS, we track down some genes that seems to be in common. And one of those is called SOD1. Apparently, when this SOD1 gene, it's malfunctioning, so it's not functioning how it should uh, do, um, the symptoms of ALS and the pathology altogether usually comes around. So this is quite important for what we're going to look at now. In 2004, at the California Pacific Medical Center, they've done an in vitro study, so using cells. What they've done is that they've taken um, motor neurons from spinal cords and they incubated it with THC. 
So they compared motor neurons that were expressing excitotoxicity, so intoxication of glutamate, and so uh, trying to reproduce a cellular model of ALS, they incubated it with THC and some others with a placebo. And they see by comparing the results of the um, oxidative damage from the free radicals and the high levels, high amount of glutamate that were present in the cells, is that they've seen that the survival rate of the cells incubated with THC was much higher than those that weren't. So what the study concluded was that THC may be very beneficial to um, possible uh, neuropro neuroprotection in ALS models. This was brought further, still in 2004, from another uh, research group. So as I said before, the malfunctioning of this SOD1 gene has been shown consistently to um, be one of the key players in the development of the symptoms associated with the ALS and the pathology of ALS. Um, so they created this uh, genetically engineered strain of mice that is called a knockout of SOD1. What that means is that they sort of ablate this gene, they, they prevent the normal functioning of SOD1 in the mice that were created in this strain and in fact they checked out and all these mice unfortunately were developing ALS so it was evaluated as a pretty good model and they, they went on and they divided, they split their mice, their ALS mice at this point into two groups. One group was given THC and one group was given a placebo. What they noticed at the end of the study was that the THC group had a much, it had a very delayed onset of the symptoms of ALS. And even when eventually, at a certain time frame, they developed the symptoms of ALS, well, the symptoms, the, the disease progression was much slower and the symptoms were much less aggressive. So they concluded that um, THC was very beneficial as a neuroprotectant for ALS and they suggested to bring this into people. In 2006 from the UK there is another study that confirmed this data. So what they've done is that again they ablated SOD1 gene but this time in a different strain of mice and again was confirming the fact that there was development of ALS so it really showed up that SOD1 it's a key gene in the development of ALS. What they've done is that, again, they divided the mice between active group and placebo group, and obviously they gave placebo to the placebo group. And to the active group, they assigned a synthetic cannabinoid, which is similar to THC and is called Win55, and on a third, still active group, um, they genetically modified the mice so that they could um, increase the rate of production of endocannabinoids by basically ablating the gene um, that gives rise to an enzyme, as said FA. What, that, what FA does is that breaks down cannabinoids. So they used these two different methods in order to see whether an increase of cannabinoids, either exogenously or endogenously, could benefit ALS patients. Taking results from these, they were pretty outstriking because the, the onset of the disease this time for the active group was several weeks later than the other mice. We translated into humans that is up to several years. Again, they noted that the, the, the symptoms were less aggressive and the disease progression was much slower. They concluded by saying that THC and whole cannabis possibly could be a fantastic treatment not only for the management of the symptoms but also for possibly controlling the progression of the disorder. There has been done an extensive work of review from the um, Temple University in Pennsylvania and uh, Washington Medical Center in Seattle. So what they've done is that they reviewed all possible uh, studies with cannabis, cannabinoids and ALS. 
fantastic job. You can uh, check that out on PubMed, obviously. And uh, they concluded, they say, from all present data, cannabis might be beneficial as slowing the progression of the disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and increasing life expectancy. But most of all, increasing the, the quality of life by substantially reducing the overall burden of the disease. I think th this is quite critical, to be honest. Uh, um, in most countries in the world, there are still a lot of difficulties for patients with ALS to get medical cannabis. Uh, there are estimated 30,000 patients just in the USA with ALS. However, in most countries in the world, there are no clear law regulation on cannabis use. There are no mutual recognition, so even when cannabis is allowed, it's very expensive, and there is no clear quality control being carried out, so it could be very unsafe. Most patients in the world are still relaying on the black market, and I feel it's really time to change because it's a matter of human rights. So this time, maybe instead of sending out ice buckets on our head, maybe we could send out a little bit of information on this. Thank you for listening.